Yes. So welcome to the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities breakout session. Um, in this session, we are going to have uh, two speakers who are uh, holders of have held uh, an ERC starting grant. And uh, they will tell us uh, their wisdom, share with us uh, on applying for a grant and their success. And uh, we will have a Q&A afterwards. So I would suggest, um, if that works for everyone, that you, know, you can post questions on the public chat as soon as they keep coming to your mind. Um, but it might be better if we have the two speakers back to back and then we can have uh, a joint discussion, as it might be that they share experiences that might be helpful for everybody. So um, hopefully this is working out. We have two fantastic speakers. They are also fellows of the Young Academy of Europe. Um, we have Lydia Schumacher, who is reader in historical and philosophical theology at King's College London, where I'm also based by a different faculty. And then we have Kayo Sinemaki, who is Associate Professor of General Linguistics at the University of Helsinki. So, um, Lydia, would you like to start with your presentation? I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Caius is also joining us, I believe, and uh, he actually is going to introduce our presentation and we're going to share that a little bit, so I'll let him begin. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, on my part, my name is Caius Sinemaki, and so, so Lydia and I, we're not going to do individual presentations, but we present together, but I'll, I'll start. So um, let me see if I can go to the next slide, which I actually can't do now. Actually, if I can say one more housekeeping, housekeeping thing, sorry. Um, yes. Because we started late due to the technical difficulties, uh, if it's okay for everyone, we can run over and still keep an hour. So do uh, 15 plus. Yes? Great. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, Ayus, I do you want me to take? Do you want me to take presenter and do the slides for you? Yeah, or? maybe. I can't do anything with the slides at the moment. <laughs> so maybe. Okay, great. So here's just very briefly about what Lydia and I are going to present. So we are going to give a brief introduction from the applicant's perspective about the ethos of ERC grants and what this thing called breakthrough science is and how do we understand it and how we were trained um, when we applied. We will talk a little bit about the application itself and then um, we are going to tell about our own proposals and how we how we developed our big idea and then in the end the QA session. But we hope to give the majority of the time for questions and answers. So then the next slide. So what is the ethos of ERC grants? You heard um, the introduction in the plenary about this. Um, I, what I have learned is that there is actually quite a mundane background to the ERC grants, simply to prevent brain drain from the EU countries to the United States. And the solution to this was to, to make it attractive for the best researchers in the EU to stay here by generously funding um, um, scientific research. So here's a quotation, uh, a little bit longish quotation about what breakthrough research is. Um, the breakthrough research, also known as high-risk research, is transformative, ambitious, and mold-breaking research. Its significance may be based on tackling exceptionally wide and complex research problems, on challenging established theories and scientific paradigms, on radically new ways of using methods, and so on. Um, we will talk a little bit more about this, hopefully in such practical terms also that um, we can convey to you how that 
how you could trans transform this idea into your own applications. So maybe we could go to the next slide then. So what is this breakthrough thing? Um, the breakthrough is mostly about that there is some kind of a big challenge in the field and there is a big risk involved that um, maybe the project can lead to um, an answer but it may also fail but there is some kind of a good plan also to to mitigate and manage that risk so that the research is not only groundbreaking but there is also this element this promise of a breakthrough so what we both Lydia and I were uh, trained is that uh, actually um, quite often ERC grants in like previous ERC grants uh, were not did not reach a breakthrough so nowadays what the ERC wants is that um, every sub part of the project needs to be at least groundbreaking even though the project itself might not lead to this breakthrough so from from, from an applicant's perspective we we'll, i think we would like to stress that the erc grant is not just about making uh, like the the top science and the proposal is not just about um showing that uh your proposal is great and you um, you try to tick in all the boxes um, to make it make it look good, but you have to have some good. You have to have a good pitch in order that there is this promise for a breakthrough in the project. Um, maybe we could move forward. Okay, uh, maybe Lydia, you can take on from here, and I can continue then after that. Great. Thank you so much, Kaios. Um, as Kaios has already explained, it's so crucial to have a pitch that's really orientated towards what the ERC is looking for. And in terms of that pitch, as Kaios has said, it's really about, I'm going to do groundbreaking thing X, and that will lead to breakthrough Y. Um, and it's crucial, I think, before you start writing your application um, to really look very carefully at the ERC handbook. You know, I like to say meditate on it, read it day and night, and, and try and understand when they talk about things like high risk, high gain, or what are the important challenges that you're going to address in the proposal. This is really something that has to be um, taken seriously, and and that challenge, as Kaya said, is really the question of the breakthrough. Um, what challenge will you address? So another really crucial element of meditating on the ERC uh, guidelines, which are uh, quite long, as as you know if you've looked them up, is to think about what panel that best fits your research. And you can find out a lot about the panels, both in the ERC handbook and then on the ERC website. Um, I, for instance, was in panel SH5. Kaios, were you SH3, perhaps? I was SH4. Uh, oh, SH4, that's right. And um, every panel has their own distinctive uh, scholarly orientation and the panel members won't necessarily be in your field, but you can get a sense for the kind of scholarship they do and where you might fit in relation to that. Something that we've both been advised at different points is that it's usually best to just choose one panel. They do allow you to select an alternate panel or a kind of backup panel, but often this leads to confusion between the two panel chairs as to where your proposal really fits, and there's a bit of a risk that your proposal will end up in a panel that isn't really a good fit uh, for you. So it's important that you do the research on the ethos of the panel to, to get a sense of where you should propose your work. 
a really helpful exercise in terms of identifying, um, thinking through your own research, your own project. And what's the groundbreaking dimension versus the breakthrough dimension of my project is just to look at abstracts, especially in your panel, uh, which are all online on the ERC website. Get a sense of what other people have done. If you have um, a friend or a colleague who's had a successful ERC grant, whether or not that's in your panel, one of the most helpful things to do is just to get a sense of what works with the ERC, what kind of um, proposals have, have passed. Now, um, you may well be able to email some of the people on the website who have had a successful proposal in an area close to you, and they may be kind enough to share your, their proposal with you. Sometimes when the project is actually going on, um, universities uh, will bar people from sharing their proposals. This, this does happen because, of course, there are intellectual property um, issues there that need to be protected. But um, there, there is a very, uh, it is a good approach to just think about writing to people and asking to share their proposal if your university doesn't already have sampled proposals. Um, Kaya, is anything you want to add in this? No. I want to move on and talk about more about the two parts of the proposal. And I'm, Kaya, feel free to jump in at any point if you have additional thoughts. There are two versions, if you want, of the proposal, as you probably already know. The B1, which is, I think, six pages, and the B2, which is something like 14 pages. You have to submit them both at the same time, but they have very different functions, and it's important to think about where these different versions of the short and the long version of proposal are going to land when you're writing them. So the B1 is just read by the panel of your choice and it's used by them to decide if, the, if you should pass the first step. So it needs to be a little more accessible. It needs to get the panel excited about your project. The breakthrough, uh, the why of the project if you want, it needs to really shine through clearly. So. What I've said here on the on the slide is, you know, B1 really focuses on what and why. What is your project? What are you gonna do? What is X? <laughs> you know, what is the substance of your work and why is it important? What breakthrough is it going to achieve? What challenge is it going to address? Tell them what it's about and, and why it's exciting. Get them, get them enthusiastic about it. Now B2, the longer version, is probably going to be read by specialists of some kind in your field. And they will have more specific questions on exactly not just what and why this project, but how. What, what specific work packages are you going to undertake? You can mention those work packages in V1, of course, and you probably should. But getting into the real nitty gritty of this is how the team's gonna function on a daily basis. This is our work timeline. Um, these are, you know, the specifics of our outputs and, um, and so on and so forth. That really goes in B2 more than B1. I've often been advised not to just copy and paste B1 and B2. I think the best strategy definitely, definitely is to start writing B1. Write the full proposal, the long version get all the details of that really clear in your brain. If you start writing B1 first, um, it's the project, the fullness of the project still isn't clear in your mind. And so it may not be um, as strong of a representation of your full idea as it could be. So start with that B2 and then go back to um, B1. Now within the proposal B2, there are two major sections and the ERC only gives you these two sections effectively that you need to address. Um, state of the art and objectives and then methodology. I like to think of the state of the art and objectives section as the kind of what is my project, 
why is it important? And the methodology is more how. How are we going to accomplish this? What are the work packages? That said, the beauty of the ERC, I think, is that um, these, these uh, guidelines are not prescriptive. You define what breakthrough research in your field looks like. You define what groundbreaking research looks like in your field. And exactly how you use the space very much will, I think, show them um, whether you have command of your subject, whether you have something to contribute. So you shouldn't feel constrained like, oh, the ERC application has to look like this and there have to be so many pages on state of the art and so many pages on methodology. It really will be defined um, by the research that you have to do. I've seen some proposals with a relatively short state of the art and a much longer methodology or some with a much longer state of the art and a shorter methodology. And it's important to remember that you are the dreamer here. <laughs> you are the visionary. Um, and they're looking to see that transferred onto paper. A little more specifics, as I've already said, about the state of the art objectives and methodology. So the, um, the process uh, of actually writing your proposal, it won't start kind of in these categories of, oh, groundbreaking and breakthrough. You'll have your own ideas. You'll have been thinking about this or that for a while. And what I like to think about writing an ERC proposal is like getting deeper and deeper into your own research and kind of finding out what at the core of these topics and ideas that you have really um, does have a potential to break, make a big breakthrough, address an important challenge. Um, so get your ideas out there in the first instance and then start to kind of hone in and think about how you can pitch it in the way that will be um, appropriate for an ERC grant. Um, let's see, I think a really crucial thing to remember if you're working in the, so in the humanities at least, and probably the social sciences, is that the state of the art or STOA section um, should really show how your research is addressing a gap. So say everyone in my field thinks, um, you know, in this way about this set of material, and I'm gonna think in a different way about this set of material. And it's gonna produce a different um, result than um, has previously been the kind of dominant perspective. This formula may not work for you, but it really has to show that there's something missing in the way of thinking about your, th your material um, and how you're going to approach that. Methodology, of course, will go into the details of the actual work um, on the project. I have seen proposals start with a description of work packages. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. I'm an explanation of what research team members will be working on the project, who will work on what work package, um, how will they relate to one another? How will they communicate? Will you have conferences? Will you have day meetings? Will you have Skype calls? And then you can have, you need to have some information generally towards the end of that methodology section, just to give the panel or readers, I'm sorry, an idea of the outputs, um, the workflow, the timeline. We're gonna do work package one in the first year and work package two will start also in the first year but run through the third year, this kind of thing. Um, and then the very important section should probably be in there at some point on the risks, impacts, and beneficiaries. And that question of risks and impact and beneficiaries will have been there throughout the proposal, as Kayu said, but at some point it's probably good also to wrap that up and really um, bring it together towards the end of the proposal. I don't know if Kayu, you want to add anything um, about, I, but. 
Yeah, I could maybe say just briefly about the B1 and B2. Please. So, um, like Lydia said about the... Oh, I think you're muted. Okay. Ah, yes. there we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. But that uh, the B1 is written to a different audience than the B2. So the B2 is written to specialists of your own field. But then the B1 is not written to the to specialists in your field, but to the panel um, to which you submit the application. So it's really important to look at what kinds of fields are represented in that particular panel and get some kind of an idea how do they approach these sorts of topics. So for instance, uh, my project is um, a linguistic project where I combine what is called sociolinguistic and cross-linguistic approaches to language variation. So I quite carefully went through the panel, the different fields represented in SH4 to think about how do they approach language uh, in these fields uh, and trying to trying to pitch my B1 and also then B2 uh, to this panel, but especially B1, because that's that's the selling, that's this, um, um, that's the part of the proposal that you need to sell to the panel. And once you have done that, then the experts will look at the details and, and so on. Okay, that was it. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I muted myself, Caius, because it's in order to avoid an echo for you. But um, yeah, I think the panel, they may have already mentioned that often the panel for you will be the same as it was two years ago. So if you apply in 2020, look online at who was on the 2018 panel. This may be overkill, but my personal practice was to go to their webpage uh, of the panel members, read about them, um, it's often the case you can identify several panel members who are in adjacent fields to your own. Um, I looked up their articles, I looked up their books. If I thought it would help me understand the kinds of questions um, they would have or things they would be excited about. And I did actually find in my interview that they asked me questions um, that I felt I could predict on the basis of things I had read by them before the interview. So it's, Caius is absolutely right. Know your panel. Not only know your funder, but know your panel. Um, please. Ah. So um, we have a few other comments. Um, Caius, I don't know if you, um... Yes, I could start from here. So I could briefly tell about, uh, tell about my proposal. Lydia, yes, thanks. Uh, the noise is, noise is circulating. So, um, I think quite often when, uh, applying for the ERC crown and when going to different, uh, trainings, trainings, um, the whole application process just feels overwhelming and it looks like okay um i can never get that grant that it looks like the erc only funds the best of the best and i could never get there well um for instance when i was reviewed um some reviewers outright said that well this guy doesn't have a stellar um, publication record, but it's still okay. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree that I'm quite behind compared to the best of the best in my field, but I'm still sort of okay. But where I think I managed to do well was in creating a particular pitch in, in my ERC proposal and being a, able to convince them that I I know what the risks, the, the really practical risks, and then the conceptual and methodological risks, and that I have some kind of reasonable idea how to uh, address those risks. So, but, but that process wasn't easy. 
So when I was preparing for the the interview, I still was struggling that what is actually the breakthrough in my in my proposal? How how do I present it and and really crystallize it to the panel in the interview? And I think I had something like four or five mock interviews that gradually helped me to crystallize my ideas and how to present my proposal in in the interview session then. What also helped me was that um, I looked at the kinds of fundings that I had gotten in my career at that stage, whether grants or postdoc positions, and then looking at their success rate. And then I was like, okay, these are about the same level that ERC starting grant. So in some years, ERC starting grant rates are around 9% uh, success rate. And then some years, uh, even up to 16% of the applicants get the, uh, get the grant. So actually, it's, it's not like 2% or 4%. Four, four so that is already sort of, sort of good news that uh, it's not just sheer luck. Of, of getting it. Um, maybe I could briefly then just maybe two minutes tell about my my um, what I did for my uh, application. So I actually started working on this theme already in my dissertation. I I had my defense in 2011 and I got the ERC starting grant in 2018. So uh, that was quite late already when I got the grant. But I had started the work already in my dissertation, and then I identified quite many problematic areas. I wanted, I was I continued that same research theme in my postdoc, but then I just ran into so many methodological issues that I I practically put the whole theme on the shelf. And not just on the shelf, I actually told to my colleague that. Uh, hey, I'm. I just decided I'm not going to pursue this thing, this whole theme anymore. I'm going to do something else. And uh, she said that, yeah, me neither. And uh, now she's working in my in my. Uh, I hired I hired her to work in my my uh, project. But um, there was a time when I I was really fed up with the whole topic, just because I I had bumped into these problems, both like conceptual, methodological, and some uh, related to data. But on the other hand, that helped me to really get a good grasp of the challenges. And then when I sort of got the hope that, yeah, maybe maybe I could actually get the grounds and that I need to apply, and there were people who really um, encouraged me to do that and that had a big deal that was a big deal for me so um then i had a very good grasp of the methodological the conceptual and data related challenges but that that was in a nutshell um, um what led me to apply and um create create my application so maybe Lydia, you have some uh, experiences from from your own research. Sure, I, I just a couple somewhat unrelated things that occurred to me while you were talking about um, success rates is I, this may or may not be true, but I have heard that sometimes the last year in a budget year, uh, EU budget year, which is this year, there can be more budget than in the first year of an EU, you know, seven year budget round. So one is that this may be a good year to apply. Um, another um, factor is that I've heard if you do not succeed the first time, um, but you get reasonably good reviews and you take the reviewers comments seriously, then you can have a quite high chance of success if you apply again. Um, my audio seems to be a little bit out of whack. Is it better? Okay. Um, I wonder, 
should we move? I mean, I could share from my own experience, but I think Kyle's is, is quite a perfect encapsulation of um, how it works. And I wonder if we should allow time for questions, but I'm happy to share more about my own experience um, in the course of that time. What do you think, Kaios? Maybe I could just very, very briefly share about, um, um, what, like continue from what you said, Lydia, that if you apply and um, your proposal is rejected, but you get good remarks and good comments, um, it makes perfect sense to apply and not just once if uh, to reapply and not just once if you get a second rejection, but try the third time. The reason why that is crucial is that um, the panels, the panel members are in for three years, but they, they serve in the panel every second year. So if you submit in 2021, well, let's not go there. It's just too complicated. But, but if you submit one year and then you reapply the next year, that next year the panel will be different. The panel composition will be different. But if you apply then the following year, then it will be mostly the same panel composition again. And I have seen a fair fair number of ERC grants uh, grantees who who uh, have applied two or three times. So uh, not not everybody gets gets the grant on this on the first try. Okay, maybe we can leave this slide last slide here, and then uh, maybe that will raise some questions also, and we could probably move into into the Q and A session. So I think our procedure, if I recall, was just to type your question into the chat for us to address. Emma may have advice on this, and then um, one or both of us can offer some, some thoughts. Hi, yes, thank you. I mean, it's, it's such a pleasure to attend this talk. You guys are being very relatable and very honest in your presentation, so I'm sure everyone is appreciating that. Um, I seem to be having some drama myself with this uh, um, platform, so I can't see the screens, but I'm sure mine. I don't know if you can see it. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I think it's best if we take the questions from the chat and, and you answer them as they come because because we might, it's a bit unstable, so we might run into more issues if people I hope this is okay for everyone. Yeah, of course. I think we already have. I'm just flipping over to the public chat. Let's see what our first question is. Um, Okay, okay. Ah, is it possible to have a Marie Curie and an ERC at the same time? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that, but I would strongly suspect not. I know that there are rules about holding two ERCs at the same time, and you cannot apply for another ERC unless you're already like two years and nine months or something through your current ERC, um, it would, you would need to look up those rules specifically, which will be in the handbook. But I know that it's not possible with two ERCs um, unless you meet certain terms of these, you know, you're already more than halfway through your project. What do you do if one reviewer's score is significantly different than the other three, which are pretty similar. Ooh, Kyos, I don't know. Please jump in at any point. Okay, uh, maybe, Lydia, if you can. Um, okay, great. So about the Marie Curie and ERC, I think this, this answer applies to pretty much all grants, that if you have an ongoing grant and you get the ERC, then the ERC wants you to start the grant within six months of uh, receiving the grant. 
if there are good scientific reasons for postponing the beginning of the grant, the ERC grants, then they may, then you can start it later. But then have, having the having two grants going on at the same time at the starting grant level, that's not very often the case, and especially because they require uh, at least fifty percent commitments. And quite often, the host institution actually wants way more than fifty percent um, commitments. In my case, that was eighty percent commitment, and then there there is simply just no room for other other uh, commitments. Maybe I could take the uh, Sibel's question about the review scores. Uh, the thing is that um, if you get to the second stage, there will be probably in the range of from eight to twelve review reports. So I got nine review reports, and then uh, I don't know. Maybe they average average uh, the scores of each each applicant. Um, okay, Lydia, maybe you can continue from this. You can also name three people that you don't want to review your application if you have any enemies out there um, that you think would be problematic in reading your proposal. Um, I think if you have that situation, it's a good good thing to reapply because it may have been a quirky review. How long did you work on your application? Well, I'm not the person to ask because I'm obsessive about starting really early. And I would say that in the case of my starting grant, I started thinking about it probably two years, year and a half before I applied. And uh, it really did actually take me between August and November, I think I really intensified my preparation because I had done a lot of thought about the project and the ideas and the sources, but I hadn't really got to that breakthrough and groundbreaking bit. Um, and that I really spent a lot of time on between August and November when the deadline was in something like mid-November. I would leave yourself certainly for six months, but make sure that you've already got something to build on. Um, someone asked about consulting and services. I think we've both attended a Yellow Research Day and they're based in the Netherlands. They are brilliant. They are just amazing. I mean, when you're talking about this idea of what does the ERC really mean by high risk, high gain, and so on and so forth. Yellow Research really knows knows what they're explaining there. So if you can get them to um, come to your university or read your proposal, which will cost about a thousand euros or something, this is this is great. Um, would you propose? several ideas, papers, closely related or possibly diverse. I'm not entirely sure what that question means. Propose, oh, propose several, I, I, do you mean in the outputs or, Caius, do you know? If you could clarify, Anne, what you mean by this question, that would be great. When will there be a list of panel members for the 2021? Look at 2019. That's as close as you'll get because uh, they won't actually publish the panel they, for, to, for your interview. You won't know when you go into the interview who's on your panel. There could be some slight changes from two years ago. Um, you may not see everyone there. You may have to see a few different people, but supposedly the majority panel from two years ago largely stays the same. Um, what do reviewers actually evaluate in terms of previous experience in leading projects, amount of money granted, number of people included in the project? Um, Kais, that, that's a good question. Before I had my ERC, I had a British Academy postdoc which is three years for research, but it was just me. I didn't, I'd never led a team before. So in that case, um, you really have to make a case for other things that you've done. Maybe you've organized a conference. Maybe 
you, um, in my case, I'd worked on a large, um, I'd been an employee on a large grant team and served as a co-editor for a big multi-volume project. And so um, you have to find other evidence of uh, leadership and leadership potential that you can put in your career track record section. I just, I don't know if you, please, please don't let me keep jabbering if there's anything you want to say. I, I think, like I mentioned earlier, that um, you don't have to be the best of the best, but there is some kind of uh, vague probable limit that you have to pass. And uh, actually, the ERC gives you that limit that you have to have at least one or two publications after your uh, dissertation uh, without your supervisor and so on. So they have some kind of a minimum limit, but whatever uh, experience you have in um, getting external funding or some positions, um, supervising PhDs, supervising MA students, um, coordinating a course, coordinating um, a workshop, or some 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 sorts of things like that, or being being a prominent member of a network. So any any. Um, Things like that help help uh, in um, showing that you have the potential of of leading this kind of a team. I could maybe raise up a few things here, questions. As a, like Mila asked, how long did you work on your application? And Lydia said that she uh, worked on it for a long time. Well. I didn't. <laughs> uh, I think I worked pretty well under stress. So I started working the wrong way. So I started writing the B1 first, like two months before the deadline. And then having written that in something like two days, I was like, ah, this is just not working. And then in the end, I think I wrote the whole thing in something like three weeks. Uh, once the thing really crystallized to me and I got enough encouragement <laughs> to apply <laughs> that uh, then I just pushed pushed myself and um, but don't don't do that that's way way too short uh, so um, often I I think to to get a good hold of the the challenges in the field requires several months of thinking probably a year or two uh, but to start writing it, maybe half a year or a few months would would be would be reasonable. Then, Vasilikis Vasilikis question about does it make any difference if you actually have a set of team in, in advance? I think it does, and that's a point of risk also. So if you list any team members in the proposal, that is a potential risk that you should avoid of taking because what if a team member, a potential team member, gets a better offer from somewhere, um, and then you have built part of your proposal based on their skill sets. So that is an unnecessary risk. So please don't name any team members in your proposal. You can have any number of team members in your mind, and you can recruit them directly. When once you get the funding, but no, don't na name them in the proposal. I might just add there that I did name all of the people in my proposal in my starting grant, and none of them ended up working on the project uh, for health reasons, got another job, you know, something like this. Um, and actually, I got some feedback that said oh, it's great. She really knows, you know, she's really networked in her field. She's got some really good people on her project. Uh, so I, at the risk of, you know, saying that there could be a, a different approach, I would say it's, again, it's so much down to your project. I mean, it maybe there's a you don't want too many very senior people because then there could be this sense that you would be overshadowed and you'd have this professor pushing you around, telling you what to do on your own project, which is really no go. Um, 
but it can work. I mean, if you, it, it really depends on you. It depends on the relationship you have with the person. The one thing I would say is do not name people that other people tell you to name. Do not do this. Name people that you know them, you work with them. They're the best for this. Um, but but don't, don't let a professor or a colleague say, oh, I have this student. You should have them work on your project. This can be dangerous. Um, hiring, though, I think is, as Caillou says, it's a really good idea because then it lets you find the very best uh, potential candidates. So it's, it's a bit of a delicate question. I do know of people who named everyone on their grant, and maybe it's just my field that we're a small field, but it can depend. Um, there's another question. Do you have one main idea for your project or do you have several ideas? Um, well, I would say that this is what work packages are all about. So, you know, you can have um, a work package on, say you're a philosopher, maybe you'd have one on metaphysics and one on psychology and one on ethics. And these are kind of totally different areas. But if you bring them all under one heading of kind of you're going to approach philosophy from a different perspective with a different methodology, then of course you can have um, different work packages, different ideas, but somehow you do need to bring them together under uh, a broader theme. I don't know if you have anything to add up there, Kaios, or... Um, uh, Yes, I could maybe very briefly um, answer Anne's question that um, should you have several ideas? Well, I think this really boils down to you knowing what the gap is, what you what is the big research question that you are asking, and usually it is well, I don't maybe it's wrong to say it usually, but but in my case what I did is that I formed one big question and then I broke it down to uh, several smaller questions that I then um, turned into tasks in the work packages that uh, I had several different tasks that then then tackled these um, sub questions. So that that was what I did. The problem with having several big questions is that it's it may easily look too ambitious. So it's it's difficult for the reviewers to see to get a hold to get a hold of it and uh, to understand what's what is really being proposed. Um, Anne is asking also, can you apply people with the grant? So um, I'm not sure about that question, but maybe maybe I can, maybe I can just uh, emphasize Lydia's point that yes you, you can have senior people on on board in the team but it might not be good to tell tell things like I'm going to hire this professor in my team for five years because they will probably overshadow you and that that will not look good so that will there will be a conflict in terms of uh, your independence but maybe you can say that yeah I, I will hire the senior pe person for one year because I need them for this particular task and that's it The question about co-authors and outputs, I think it really depends on the field. I think I'm a very much a humanities um, history of philosophy person, and we, w we wouldn't do co-authorship. It would, it would not be good for the career of a postdoc to not have the opportunity to publish their own independent article, even if it is on your project. So I would say... Uh, I know in the sciences, co-authorship is just ubiquitous. Everyone does it. That's the best way. Um, your, your team members can be co-authors. They can be contributors to a shared project, shared volume. But I think they should also have some personal integrity in their own right. I mean, to, on the one hand, um, they are extensions of your brain and they are hired to do some part of a project that you have envisaged, but that can still be something they can make their own. Um, 
and publish independently. Um, names of the panel, okay. Um, what are the elements that differentiate a very good project from an excellent project? And another question, how um, would you distribute the pages? I would say again with the pages, it's so much determined by by your project. Maybe the state of the art is something that goes on and on. I mean, I do feel like I've, I've heard a good guideline for state of the art is four to six pages, methodology three pages, and work plan five pages. So method work plan is included under methodology, things like what outputs, what are the resources you need, what are the team members, what's your timeline um, for working. So um, yeah, it, it, it really does vary, but maybe that's a rule of thumb. I don't know, Kais, I mean, maybe you want to go back to these questions on risk and um, I think, I mean, it's, it's hard almost to speak in the abstract about, about these ERC projects. I mean, I, if I just tell you, okay, my project was to research early Franciscan philosophers who worked in the early 13th century. Uh, nobody studied them before because they think that they just re re rehearse past authorities from the early church and from the history of philosophy and they're kind of not very interesting at all. Uh, so in a way you could say the groundbreaking project is you research them for the first time. But why? So far, you know, this is, if there's no reason to research them because they're boring, then why would you do that? So I needed to say, well, actually, I think there's more to them than has been noted because um, they're, they used a, a method of argument which uh, involved invoking past authorities to defend their own ideas. And if you realize that they're defending their own ideas and using proof texts, then suddenly you see that they are more interesting. So that's the groundbreaking part. You have a different perspective on some material that everyone's maybe looked at or nobody's looked at that somehow brings that material to light in an interesting way. But that's not enough. That research somehow has to do something more than just produce a bunch of books on early Franciscans that show they're more interesting than everyone thought. What the project, what my proposal was, is to show that this has implications for how we understand the origins of modernity. Because there have been a lot of links and lack of clarity around how Franciscan philosophy precipitated the development of modern philosophy and the Enlightenment and so on and so forth. And so what I promised, without going into the details of that, is that somehow my study of these early Franciscans would shed some light on the questions of the origins of modernity, which are interesting, not just for medievalists, but for Renaissance specialists, early modernists, political philosophers, history or historians of e economics, and so on. So lots of people can produce an interesting groundbreaking project, but whether you can show that that research is um, going to have some further benefit or impact or a interest or breakthrough is really another question. And I think that's what gets funded when you have a convincing breakthrough, even if it's high risk, like showing that early Franciscans explain where modernity came from, which is high risk. <laughs> so anyway, I hope that helps. Any more I, I would yeah. maybe add to Marco's questions about what differentiates a very good project from an excellent that uh, um, probably many of you have applied funding from a national funding agency and uh, and have gotten funding from a national funding agency. But ERC is different. So uh, the scope must be bigger and there must be this element of risk that we emphasized um 
what I did in in my proposal was that I looked at okay, there's 1.5 million um, euros, and I also know I decided that okay, I'm not going to fund PhD students that the uh, the problems and challenges that we have are too serious for a PhD student, so that I must um, hire postdocs. And then I turned that into a question: Okay, how many months of postdocs I can I can hire? So then I saw that okay, three postdocs each for three years. And then when I realized that, then that helped me to ask another question: That okay. How much can actually three postdocs do in three years? And uh, that helped me to narrow down the questions and so on. Um, quite often in humanities, social sciences, we, we, especially in humanities, ERC projects, we create some kind of databases, but databases are not the point, although databases provide interesting data for other researchers also, but they must be linked to interesting, theoretically interesting research questions and help you answer uh, interesting research questions. Okay, maybe that's enough about that. Yeah, I think we may have to close so we can turn it to Jenna, Gemma. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much again. It's been such a fantastic session. Um, you've done a fantastic job sharing your experiences, and uh, I'm sure this has been really helpful for our attendees. Thank you all of you uh, again uh, for joining us and, um, and, and for the stimulating questions that you've posted in the chat. I think we've made it nice and um, interactive. So now I'm just showing you this slide, which was also shown at the end of the plenary session just so you can all um, um, and, um, find out that we have this uh, mentoring um, scheme where we will aim to match a mentee with a mentor who will be someone from a member of the Young Academy of Europe who has had or, uh, or holds an, an ERC starting grant. Um, the, the sort of rules are that um, you need to be applying for an ERC starting grant in the 2021 call, uh, so in the next call, and uh, that your prospective host institution will be in either a US uh, EU 13 or associated country. As you know, the, the, one of the focuses of the Young Academy is widening participation and make sure we have representation of researchers based in, 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 in those areas. So um, the idea is to um, fill in this form that uh, is here on the shared notes. I can also, um, hope you can all see on the, here on the left menu this, uh, link but i can also put it in the public chat um, and if you have any questions you can contact mentorship at yakaduro.org and uh and they will be able to help you so thank you very much again apologies for the technical glitches that we had earlier and uh, i wish you all the best and i hope each and every one of you gets a starting grant right bye